Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and in this video we're breaking down Alice in Borderlands Season 2. The first series ended in a big way, and in it we followed several characters stuck in a city that was filled with deadly games and obstacles. Those that won were given specific playing cards that all helped to denote things like the game's difficulty and themes. Spades were physical games, clubs were team ones, diamonds were an intelligence test, and hearts were an emotional one. The number represented the difficulty, and the characters had to play these games in order to collect these cards. The survivors we followed eventually ended up in a beach hotel, where several of the players collected all the cards because they believed that attaining these would send everyone home. In the end, they were forced to play a literal witch hunt in order to get the elusive Ten of Hearts. In the end, it was revealed that the victim Momoka was actually the witch herself, and that this was all an elaborate ruse controlled by the game makers. Before they could place her on the fire of judgement, Naragi showed up, and they duked it out whilst the place burned around them. They eventually threw her body into it, and found footage of both her and Asahi, who had revealed herself as one of the dealers during the games. Now these are characters that organised the games to extend their visas, meaning that they didn't have to constantly take on challenges in order to stay alive. Now it turned out they'd found the Game Master's Lair, which is where Arisu and Yusagi ended up travelling to. Here they met up with their allies Chi, along with Queena, and discovered the Game Master's dead. It was revealed that they'd all been players as well, and a woman named Mira appeared and announced that there would be new games for the face cards. In Season 2, we learn that she's the Queen of Hearts, and we'll talk about this more towards the end of the video. But that should be you fully caught up, and for the rest of the breakdown, it's full spoilers ahead for Season 2. If you enjoy the video, please hit the thumbs up button, and make sure you subscribe for breakdowns like this every day. By the way, thank you for clicking this, now let's get into Alice in Borderlands Season 2. So for the first part of the video, I sort of want to go through a quick recap of the season and the game so that it adds more context to the end. If you want to skip ahead though, I won't be mad, and I'll even tell you what's on the back of your neck. It's a spade, mate. It's a spade, honest. Now, I love the way this season opens, with us watching violence in a game and how it's used for entertainment, which juxtaposes the mayhem that we cut to in Borderland. From here, we pick up immediately after the events of Season 1 and watches the survivors from the beach return. Hunted by an anti-tank rifle, the series begins with a bang, and it plays out with them pretty much becoming fish in a barrel. We watch as the King of Spades manoeuvres through the town with his blimp behind him, and these new boss-level characters become some of the main antagonists in the series. I absolutely love the plot devices of these, and it adds an extra dimension to the game. The King of Spades is different to the other ones, as it has no designated area, and its head Shirabi is something that we discover more about in the source material. He was an extremely skilled mercenary who carried with him the belief that to live is to suffer. Thus he sees these killings as being acts of mercy, and his strategy tends to be to let people gather in one place in a large number so that they're easier to dispatch. Now in his dying breath, we see a flash of him standing over a man with his gun drawn. The manga tells the backstory of this in full, and this was his war buddy Apache. They were dispatched on a job behind enemy lines, and it was revealed that this was pretty much a suicide mission that had them as sacrificial lambs. Apache was badly wounded, and though Shirabi tried to pull him out of there, he begged for death. Apache knew it would give his friend a better chance of surviving, but he also saw it as saving him from the pain he would spend the rest of his life in. It's a very short life, but still, it would stop him from that pain. He said that he'd be saving him by shooting him, which again extends to Shirabi's outlook on life. Now, Arisu suspects that each blimp has its own game master, and that defeating the kings and queens is the key to going home. After arriving at the King of Clubs, they're greeted by Naragi, who ends up becoming the fifth player in the game. They pretty much play hide the sausage against the King of Clubs, and what we learn are the citizens of the country. These are the victors of the previous cycle that ended up winning and chose to stay in Borderland. Unlike the other players, they don't have visas and they have permanent residency, though they do have to play in the games. Though they could be written as two-dimensional characters, it's actually easy to become attached to them, and because of their sportsmanship, you kinda root for them too. The King of Clubs Kiyuma emerges as a big character from this initial game, and having to edit around this dude because of YouTube's demonetization policy felt like its own Borderlands challenge. Now in the end, he and his team lose, and the original manga actually adds some extra context to his final thoughts. It states that he lived his life to the fullest and doesn't have any regrets. 
In the source material we learn that he arrived 5 months before Ari Sue and worked his way through the games which got him to this position. Now also we see Chi playing the Jack of Hearts game at the Chao prison. Hope I pronounced that right, probably butchering all the pronunciations to be fair. Now it's basically like that bit in the office, but here they have to whittle each other down to find out who the Jack of Hearts is by saying which suit they are due to it being shown on the back of an explosive collar. It starts off all fun and games, but over time the knives come out with contestants lying to each other so that they can come out on top. Chi doesn't have any allies in the game and thus he has to guess who's lying to him and through the process of elimination by the answers given he narrows it down to a 50-50 choice. He goes with his gut and gets it right and exposes that the true Jack was communicating with another player through four cafeteria snacks. Exposed he's taken out and we also discover more about Borderland itself. Now Borderland is basically this state between life and death in which players receive several things. Either they die and continue on to death or they live and get to remain there or return to the world. Those that are pulled into the city are picked because they've had a near death experience that we'll talk about more in just a bit. Thus they're pulled in and on their journeys they see what life really means to them. If they survive they can go back and those that manage to return don't remember anything from their time. However, the manga shows that these memories can be accessed under certain conditions. Amira does have some fun with them, and she basically does every single time. Every time, every time, every time I've got a bit of a bad throat, and you probably heard some sea time that we had after the first season. Now, in the manga, she lies several times about what's going on, and initially says that it's virtual reality. This is mirrored in the show with her explaining how nanotechnology led humanity to control the whole world, and in 1,000 years in the future, we exist on dopamine which is why you should hit the thumbs up button. In the source material she says that in this VR world, the prize for winning is to be able to stay longer and design more games. However, she reveals that's a f***ing lie, much like the manga. She then says it's aliens and androids and just talks sh about how they're actually in a therapy session. It perfectly recaptures the original work and I'm sure fans will appreciate how close this is. Now, in the manga, though the therapy session isn't real, it does make Arisu realise that he's been drugged. Therefore, he kind of has it spoiled about exactly what's going on and the hospital reveal that comes at the end. By the end of the show though, he uses Usagi and what she means to him to power him on through the games. Now in reality, all of the characters in Borderland have been hit by a mysterious meteorite that descended on Tokyo. Chunks of the asteroids struck people and these are the fireworks that the characters keep referring to. Now this destroyed the city, leaving them critically injured and causing the Borderland experience. The wounds that they gained in the experience also reflect the ones they have in real life and they all have this feeling like they know each other, though they can't remember why. There's lots of timey wimey wibbly wobbly stuff and the entire time in Borderland is just a minute in the real world. Those that were closer to the blast entered Borderland first and this is why some arrived before the others. Now we see the borders of Borderland in this city and witness overgrown forests a never ending mountain range and also some elephants. Now out in the woods, Arisu meets Aguni who survived the events of the first season as well. Haunted by his past, he's teamed up with a cane who lost a leg during a Dark Knight Rises challenge. Battling it out with the King of Spades, he becomes a big threat for the season along with the remaining face cards. There's some big games throughout the season and players even taking acid baths which fills in a lot of the people's lives. In episode 6, we also see the reason why Momoka sacrificed herself and decided to become the witch. She wanted to show that people weren't selfish and this inspiration ends up helping to save Chi in the end. Slowly the face card games are played and this happens in a montage so cool, you'll be walking away from the explosions with your backs turned to it. Naragi shows up to take out Arisu and Chi and after Yunagi shows up, Chi does the ultimate sacrifice in order to save her life. And though Chi survives and they try to tend to his wounds, this is cut short when the King of Spades arrives looking like Black Noir. Easily the most threatening villain they've faced in the series, he ends up wounding a cane and Anne before going head to head with a Goonie. Queener is stabbed with a Goonie seemingly being killed as well and it felt like watching your favourite DCU actors posting white text on a black background. Thankfully they weren't killed and I, I know I, I knew what was going to happen, I, I was still like... Oh no way, I can't believe they've done this. Now they lure him to a kill room and Aguni arrives and blows him up, leaving him at death's door, which is when he ends his life. He sees a vision of him standing over Apache, which is murdered in Aguni, seeing his own vision of the past. It leaves just Arisu and Yusagi to face off against Mira, and this all plays out in a game of croquet. 
Here we have the constant head f playing out, with Arisu coming out the other side in order to finish the game. Arisu doesn't quit or forfeit the match, and thus the game ends with him finally winning. Mira is killed, and the surviving players either have to accept permanent residency, or they can just decline it. Of course, none of the characters want to stay, and Usagi and Arisu both decline, bringing the conversation from the first episode full circle. Now, he has a vision of his friends, and promises to live his life to the fullest. This is reflected throughout both the series and original work, with him deciding to turn his life around and go to college when we look at how his arc progresses in that. That doesn't happen in the show, but he decides that he won't let anything hold him back anymore and gains a new outlook on life. Man even steps up and flirts with Usagi, finally gaining some game after smashing the game. Queena is reunited with her mother, and the pair end up sharing a heart to heart. I'm pretty sure that they added her father for this scene too, with him being missing originally, I think, but let me know below if I'm misremembering that. Now we close out with it seeming like the survivors got a happy ending, however, we start to zoom in on an ominous Joker card. I don't know if we're going to be getting a season 3, but if we do, then they're probably going to expand more on this with it, revealing what was actually going on the entire time. Now, the manga wrapped up with the games being beaten, and when the Queen of Hearts was defeated, the Joker then appeared. It was revealed that he was the ruler of the game, and that he was looking over everything and everyone. Now, we don't learn whether he's a god or, or something else, and in all honesty, he acts more like the ferryman from Greek mythology. It's said that he believed there was too much random death caused by the meteorite, and thus he wanted to give everyone a second chance to return to the land of the living. Thus, he set up this limbo between life and death, and this carries away for people to make it back home. It also gave them the opportunity to remain in Borderland so that they didn't have to return to the world if they had miserable lives. Now the card's inclusion here could just be a nod to the ending of the original work, as he doesn't appear in the show like how he did in that. However, it could also hint at there being one more game that they're all stuck in, and the way it's presented does make it seem more sinister. The Joker is of course a wild card, one that changes everything, and the Joker is also known as being a trickster. Thus, this could all just be a trick, a game within a game that robs them of hope. I think that's the route they could take in Season 3, with there possibly being a focus on them getting their memories back and realising everything's not real. This could end with the Joker being revealed, but again, it's difficult to predict this stuff as it differs from the manga ending. But that's basically a lowdown of what this means, and whether this is the last season or not, you know, I think it does wrap things up nicely. Now as for my thoughts on this series, I think this topped the first, and throughout I was constantly gripped by how tense the games were. The series really hit the ground running from episode 1, and it felt like a constant game of cat and mouse. Alice in Borderland doesn't give a f about your favourites either, and I was shocked at how merciless they were with some of the deaths at points. I was just getting attached to these characters. This was a bloodbath, but much like the first season, we also had some really great human moments. It could be so easy to turn this just into mindless violence, but it's paced so well with each over the top scene being mirrored perfectly with a more toned down human one. Every character feels like they've grown, and there's several discussions between the people who want to remain in Borderland and ones that want to return home. The game is of course a metaphor for real life, with people scrambling over the top of each other just to get slightly further ahead than everyone else there. They're constantly knocked down and beaten, but there are some that see the simplicity of the city as being more manageable due to it having more straightforward rules. However, there's also the fact that people are killing each other just to add another day, and there's genuine hope that they can make the world better. It, re it really adds so much to the season, and this mystery box constantly kept me coming back for more, making it an easy binge. Now, I think some people might be put off by the pacing early on, because those first couple of games don't play out as quickly as they did in the first season. However, I think there's a lot more complexity to them, and the character building that they do by dragging them out actually adds so much more. The reveals in the collar game were so good, and I love how the series also changed the locations too. We got far beyond the usual city stuff we had last time, and it added so much more variety. Anyway, really enjoyed it, and I hope you had fun with the breakdown too. In the end, this was great, and it gets a 9 out of 10. Anyway, that's the video, and obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts on the series and what you think will happen next time. We're running a competition right now and giving away Dawn of the Dead and Black Adam to three subscribers on the 15th of January, and all you have to do to be one of the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the show. If you want something else to watch, we've got a video on screen right now just for you, and if you don't want to watch it, 
you know what have a have a great christmas and a great new year as well if you celebrate it yeah all the best for 2023 and i hope to see you on the next video you take care of yourself mate peace